Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Reflecting on the literature of his time, the late 18th century satirist Georg Christoph Lichtenberg wrote, If another and later species comes to reconstruct the human being from the evidence of our sentimental writings, they'll conclude man to have been a heart with testicles, that is, passionate and male. This witticism was also a less than flattering reference to one of the most significant intellectual movements of the 18th century. In the 1770s, a group of German artists, most of them young men, wrote a series of daring works which shocked and delighted audiences at home and abroad. Their books and plays favoured emotion, raw emotion over reason, personal liberty over morality. Their hero and figurehead was Goethe. For the tempestuous nature of their work, this movement became known as the Sturm und Drang or in English, Storm and Stress. With me to discuss Storm und Drang are Tim Blanning, Emeritus Professor of Modern European History at Cambridge University, Susanna Cord, Professor of German at University College London, and Micah Ergel, Associate Professor of German at the University of Nottingham. Tim Blanning, before we go into more detail, can we just establish what's exactly meant by Storm und Drang? Who's involved? How long did it last? Why is it called that? OK, well, a Sturm und Drang is usually translated as storm and stress, as you said in your introduction. But that's not actually quite right. I mean, I, I think I've got two native German speakers here who can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But Drang, a, Sturm and, a, a storm for Sturm is fine. But a Drang really means urge or a strong desire. So there's, there's a, more, a more sexual element, I think, in, in the German than, the, than there is in the English. It's not so much stress as an urge. As you quite rightly said in your introduction, it's a movement of the 1770s. It's quite short-lived. We're going to argue, I expect, about when it, we date it from, but 1770 is a good starting point. When it ends depends on how many people you include. If you include the young Schiller, which I will be inclined to do, then that takes us into the 1780s. But it's, it's really running out of steam by the late 1770s, I think it's fair to say. But its influence on contemporaries and on what was to come was colossal, not least because at least two really very important intellectual figures were involved. That's uh, Goethe and Herder. And as I indicated, if one includes Schiller, then that makes, uh, that makes three. And there are there's several other really quite important figures as well, like, like Lentz, the author of, of, the, of the Tutor. And what it's about, I think, is, is, put, is prioritising, putting at the centre emotions, violence, self-determination, energy action, all, all those concepts come up again and again. What was the dominant school of thought in 18th century Germany before they came along, roughly before the 1770s? As they saw it, at least, what they were reacting against. And of course, as with all movements of this kind, which are self-consciously revisionist and rebellious, they, they create, create something of an Aunt Sally. But what they're reacting against is the rationalism of the Enlightenment, especially a rationalism of the French Enlightenment. There is there there is a strong xenophobe, not francophobe, uh, nationalist element in in Storm and Stress. I expect we're going to argue about that, but I, for, for my money, it's 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 well in there from the start. So they're they're really re reacting reacting against what they see as an excessively rationalist Enlightenment. But in Germany itself, was the was the, there was a, we know there's an Enlightenment in Scotland, an Enlightenment in France, an Enlightenment in in London, and the, was there an Enlightenment in Germany? Were they writing against anything particularly German? They certainly did have an Enlightenment in Germany. Indeed, they had a contemporary word for it, which is more than can be said for most other Enlightenments. The word Aufklärung, uh, and so yes, definitely there were there were Germans against whom they were reacting and, and to whom they were very very rude. Uh, number one enemy, I suppose, was a man called Friedrich Nicolai, who was the personification of rationalist Berlin, and they're, they're very rude about him, not, not least because he writes some rather clumsy satires of, uh, of Goethe's novel Werther, for example. So they were storming the, uh, storming the establishment? Yeah, they were, yes. It's not kicking down an open door. There was something there to attack. Um, Susanna Cord, what do you f let's talk a little bit more about the Enlightenment, which Tim Banning has introduced. Mm -hmm. This Enlightenment had a huge effect across most of the countries in Europe. What effect did it have, say, on German literature and the way it was written? German literature changes massively in the 18th century, largely because the understanding of the human being changes in the during the Enlightenment. If we go back again um, a little bit in the 17th, in the Baroque era, people, most people, tended to believe that suffering is 
is a good thing for humans because the more you suffer, the, ha the greater your reward in heaven. And here comes the Enlightenment to say that man is endowed with reason. This is Immanuel Kant. Um, man can be educated to use his reason. And the purpose of all of this education is to lead a virtuous life and to lead a happy life. And this is a radical thought, um, leading a happy life here on earth. Literature obviously has to reflect that. And with all of that um, new uh, role, with the new role of educating human beings to virtue and happiness, comes the task really of lifting literature from where it is, which is when you, when you look at German literature, pretty much in the dirt. Johann Christoph Gottsched, who in my opinion is also an, an enemy number one of the, of the Stürmer und Dränger, proposes in 1720 that the old style of drama, for example, w no longer suffices to educate human beings. Uh, the old style of drama is basically we all get together in a barn and watch the joker or the jester, the old Hans Wurst, uh, make some mildly outre jokes and touch him, touch unmentionable body parts. Um, that will no longer suffice. We will now memorize our lines. We will now write plays in the French classical style. Very, very strict formalism uh, has to be observed. Um, and that is what will uh, create a great German literature based on a either ancient Greek or French classical models. So you've given us, before, <coughs> before the Sturm und Drang has come along, you've given mm -hmm. us the Enlightenment, which itself was a reaction to... yes the barn theatre of Germany beforehand, the sort of almost medieval hangover theatre yes. uh, of the travelling players. So did that, what grip did that Enlightenment thought have on German thinkers and German life before the 1770s, just to give the, that, that a bit more context? I would say that um, in Germany, of course, you have particularism. Right. I mean, it's it's politically divided into 300 and some odd little fiefdoms ruled by uh, ruled by uh, dukes and land landgraves. There is no national unity, and the idea that you can have a culture, a, a unified German culture, that will eventually lead to a national unity, that is older than the 18th century. But I think the idea of um, of educating humanity to virtue, that is actually an enlightenment idea, that is actually a new thing. To charge literature with that specifically is a new idea. Tim gave us some very effective broad brushstrokes at the start, but can we just uh, reiterate and perhaps amplify what particular aspects of the enlightenment these Sturm und Drangers in the 17th century uh, were reacting against? What were they most uh, worried about? They were worried about the formalism. Uh, their idea, I think they are very much on board they're not totally anti-Enlightenment, actually. They're, they've been called, um, uh, again, that's a matter of controversy, but they were um, very much on board with the project of human emancipation, but they were very opposed to the formalism of literature. Um, the Alexandrine plays that Johann Christoph Gottsched put on stage, for example. And so you have this division in, within the Sturm und Dränger, um, total opposition to the early Enlightenment and Gottsched, and total acceptance, really, of the late Enlightenment and Lessing. Lessing is one of the fathers of the movement. So their idea of writing, really, is original genius. Gottsched's idea that genius can be learned, that great writing can be learned, like virtue, is, is out the window. And their idea is um, of, of aesthetics, really, is that you're kissed by the muse and the original work springs into, springs into form full-blown. Michael Ergel, one of the let's t turn to individuals now. The one of the intellectual masterminds, perhaps one of the originators, was Johann van Herder. Can you tell us something about him and what he, first of all, about him? Yes, I mean Herder is perhaps best characterized in his early years as the theoretician of Sturm und Drang. He is the, the mastermind. He is the one who provides the theory, if 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 it is a theory, mm -hmm. and um, that really touches on the things that have already been mentioned. The focus on the emotions. Herder wanted to change literature and art, but also the appreciation of literature and art by refocusing on emotional language, emotional expression, and also emotional understanding. Because he thought that aspect of human understanding had been neglected by the Enlightenment, this 
he thought the Enlightenment was not necessarily a terribly bad thing, but it was wrong in its one-sidedness, its focus on reason and rationality. And he wanted to sort of rebalance the scales by reintroducing emotional understanding, a focus on the emotion that expresses itself in language and in how you write literature. Can you tell us something about his position in German intellectual society and therefore his uh, where he is in the terms of influencing other people? Initially, he was just a sort of radical young man. He, he was well studied. He came from Königsberg. Kant, the younger Kant, was one. The, the, the pre-critique Kant was one of his his teachers. But so was um, someone called Harman, who was the other side. Whereas Kant, to some extent, represents the Enlightenment in its final glory. Harman was very much focusing on the emotions again, mm-hmm. on um, almost religious sort of. Uh, inspiration that is semi-divine but also from the the genius is inspired and had a kind of learned from both of them as a young man and I think he he initially attracted attention by simply um, formulating uh, ideas in, in, in quite a sort of fragmentary way, but nevertheless publishing them. Did he teach at the university, for instance? Um, no, not not at that, not at the point where, where, where Sturm und Drang really happens. I mean, it's his friendship with Goethe as well that kind of brings him to the attention of We'll come to that in a moment, if, if you don't mind, Micah. But in, in 1773, he edited this book of essays, and people say that is, in effect, the manifesto for the movement. What did the essays declare? The essays declare very much what we've already said already, but one um, key aspect, which I think is perhaps the kind of biggest contribution Hadder makes to um, modern thought, is his sense of history. His sense of any art or any, any idea, in fact, has to be understood in its historical context. You can't take it out of the context. And this is, is a kind of, to some extent, quite a blow to the Enlightenment idea of universal values. If you have universal values, you have a general yardstick, you apply this to everything, obviously some older literature comes up short. Um, whereas if you say, no, I need to understand this within the context of how it, when it was created, how it was created, it may be very valuable. And it was also this rebalancing of the Enlightenment sort of general, it has to be all the same, there are perfect rules, constancy of human nature, we can apply this across the board. He felt that was kind of missing quite a lot. Tim Blanning, do you want to? Yes, I think I would like to come in there because I think it's... I, I, I Personally, I would stress that it's more of a break with the Enlightenment than has been mm-hmm. indicated. And the introduction of the name of Haman, I think, is extremely important because it opens up uh, pietism. And pietism which is a long-standing religious movement within the Lutheran Church, uh, but um, a movement ag- against Lutheran orthodoxy and Lutheran hierarchy and Lutheran doctrine in favour of the inner light. And if one's looking for a single metaphor image which sums up Sturm und Drang and Romanticism, which comes afterwards, then the inner light seems to me to be to, me to be crucial. Uh, and there's a, a fine remark made by Herder in a letter to a private letter to his fiancée, uh, and in seventeen seventy one, I think it was, in which he said, "All our actions must be self determined in accordance with our innermost being. We must be true to ourselves." And that, I think, sums up the programme very well. So if an act, a thought, something that has been created is to have any value, it has to come from the inside. It has to be lit by the inner light and not created in accordance with some exterior structure of rules. So that seems to have taken us some way from religion, but I don't think it has, because the the emphasis on the inner light for a true religious conversion is to be found in Sturm und Drang in a secularised form. Does the word organic have a place here? Yes, I think it does, very much so, because um, uh, Herder and Goethe, at this time at least anyway, um, believe very much that things which grew were to be preferred to artefacts. And Goethe, when he goes to Strasbourg in 1770, which we can take possibly as a starting date for, uh, for Sturm und Drang, he has a kind of conversion experience, which in itself is a very Sturm und Drang kind of thing, uh, by looking at the cathedral in Strasbourg. He sees it and he thinks... Everything I've been taught to despise about Gothic architecture for its irregularity, its incompleteness, its barbarity and so on, seems to me to be just wonderful. It's beautiful. It's grown. It's organic. It's not even finished. It's, it's work in progress. And, and, and that comes out in this essay, which you've referred to already, which he writes for the 1773 collection of Herder. Uh, so organic is, is, is right in there, I think, as a very important concept. 
Because as as uh, Micah was saying, Susanna, the idea of the classical idea that human nature was constant, that rules were the, the three unities were constant, uh, that even the meter was constant, that was something that they found completely straightjacketed. And Indeed. Yes. Well, they they had uh, they took liberty. It's not even enough to say they took liberties with forms. They threw them out the window. They really tried to live and write their own genius theory, which meant originality. I mean, the the, the great um, ideas, the, the the great idols really of the movement are are people like both mythical characters like Prometheus, and invented authors like Ossian, and uh, they start writing. Um, against formal strictures. They start uh, ignoring the three unities. They start, their plays don't even sometimes have five acts. They don't have connected speech or even complete sentences sometimes. I mean, that is the extreme anti-formalism uh, of the Sturm und Drang. And the themes, I think, also become quite a bit more uh, controversial in some Sturm und Drang literature. They write about seduction, the consequences of seduction, infanticide, which is not really a mentionable uh, theme in literature until then. Suicide, difficult human subjects, I mean, extreme interest in the individual and what can happen to the individual. Can we just sort of, as it were, pause and take a bit of a digression here? On the, the book that was the centerpiece book, I'd like to know what each of you think, each one of you think of it. The, the Sorrows of Young Werther by mm. Goethe, published in 1774. It was a sensation, it was translated into. If it went through 30 editions in no time at all, translated to European. And let, shall we start with you, Micah? What, what, what was the impact? What was the, what was the book about? And then why, why I'll, I'll go around the table about the impact. Well, it's a huge, huge impact. The book is about a young man who can't have the woman he wants and in the end he commits, sui commits suicide. It's exactly this kind of shocking topic of suicide. One of the key kind of um, controversial passages in the book really are where Werther argues with his more rationalist kind of enlightenment figure type friend Albert um, that he has a right to kill himself, that it is his right as a human being to end his life if that is the best for him and he's not um, restricted in any way by moral or religious concerns and Albert of course argues against this, you can't do this it's against order, it's against everything and and it's really this kind of very kind of consequent sort of following of your own idea, your own intuition and seeing that through, even if that means death Yeah, I think I'm sure that's right and I, all I'd add to it is that um, is that Werther has he keeps talking about his heart that's the most important part of his body alright, um, and uh, but both literally and metaphorically uh, and it keeps on coming up uh, the, the word heart, it, it, rec it recurs again and again, and there's also in Werther um, a profound introspection he says somewhere quite early on, it's, it's incidentally the, the novel is written in the form of letters. I mean, it's strongly influenced by Rousseau. Rousseau we have not mentioned yet, but we jolly well should because Rousseau is really at the heart of all this. Uh, and it's in, in many ways it's uh, an imitation of La Nouvelle et Louise, uh, Rousseau's own, own bestseller. Uh, but Werther says in one of his early letters, I turn inside myself and I find a whole world. Uh, that's what really mattered to him, was what was happening inside himself. Um, and that this just follows on from what Michael was saying. And that, that, was, that was of paramount importance to him, what he did inside himself. What, why do you think it had this massive influence, Susanna? It had a massive influence because it is an epistolary... It is partly... I mean, it is an epistolary novel. And that means there is only one perspective. We only get Vieta's letters. We never get any answer letters back until right at the very end when he's killed himself. The editor steps in and sort of ties off, ties up the, the novel. But until then, you are in Vieta's head. And it's a difficult place to be um, because all of his trials and tribulations and his heart and his love and his angst and his extreme contempt of society and the court are portrayed in, I would say, sympathetic ways. It's outrageous stuff, and it's sympathetically portrayed. And the editor, who also introduces the novel very briefly at the beginning, he has a two-paragraph introduction in which he says to the reader that, um, that Werther is worthy of the reader's love, not just approbation, but love, and that this book should be your friend if through con uh, con conditions, out outward conditions, or your own fault, you cannot find a better one. There's your invitation to identify. And 
Tim, yeah, I think there's that? something else we might add. It just complements what's just been said, and that is that I think it made a major impact because it has a strong socially critical edge to it. Mm. Werther is a person of, of respectable family, but he's very definitely middle class, and he's mixing with aristocrats and feels on one occasion in particular that he's been humiliated by, 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 by nobles. Uh, and that, I think, struck a chord in Germany in, in, in the sort of society that existed in the third quarter of the 18th century. Mm. One of, the writers, <clears throat> one of the writers greatly admired by Goethe and taken up by other people in this movement, if you can call it that at this stage, Michael Ergel, was, was Shakespeare. Yes. Um, ma- he was massively important to them. Can you tell us why? Well, he seemed to them embody all these kind of virtues and values that they wanted to promote. I mean, a bit of context perhaps. In the sort of mid-18th century, Shakespeare was not really considered a great writer, certainly not by Enlightenment formalism, because he did not follow the rules. He, while his tragedies may have five acts, they, he didn't follow the unities um, because, well, he, he didn't, and that somehow made him faulty as a writer and there were two schools of of thought about Shakespeare in the mid 18th century one was saying he simply is not very good and and it's just it's too old and and doesn't isn't up to scratch and the other one the other school is the apologist who said ah yes but there is good stuff in there and he's worthy of 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 reading and the Sturm und Drang admiration or Herder really does this in in his one contribution to the volume that we've been mentioned that collection of essays um, he says, no, he's brilliant because he is natural. He is brilliant because he does exactly what is right in his context. And he has this kind of strong, emotional, metaphorical language that appeals to the heart and to the senses. And he he includes all of modern existence. He does, he's not just about an aristocratic set of kind of uh, gods or, or, or aristocrats. It's all social classes and it's full of subplots. He, he manages to make sense of the complexity of, of, of the modern condition. And that's why he cannot follow the unities because they belong in, an class, in a classical Greek context. That's when they were right, but then no longer. Yeah, and um, Goethe wrote his own Shakespearean play. Didn't he? Mm-hmm. 1774 is Werther. A terrific hit right across Europe. The first German novel, certainly, to have made a, 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 a work becoming a worldwide hit, published in dozens of different uh, versions, but editions. But the previous year, in 1773, Goethe had written and had performed um, a play called Goethe von Berlichingen, which is a very much Shakespearean play. It's set in the 16th century. Um, it, it breaks all the unities. There are at least two main plots and several subplots going on. Lots and lots of characters. It's it's very it's very Shakespearean, and I think self consciously so. And one thing, um, which of course my colleagues would be better to comment on than, than I am, but one of the most striking things about Goetz is its language. The language is is rough and ready. Uh, it's idiosyncratic. It's colloquial. Uh, you can hear a lot of it coming from Luther's Bible, and Luther's Bible, incidentally, through Pietism, a very important influence on the kind of language that the Sturm and uh, Drang people use. Uh, it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful play. Probably better to read than to see performed. But it it makes and it had that had a big big impact. Still on Shakespeare for a moment, Susanna. Do you think that there were lines in Shakespeare that were particularly attractive to Hamlet, but lines such as, you know, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy, that particularly attract them. We are such things as dreams are made of, the idea of the dream being superior to reason. They could find that as well in Shakespeare, couldn't they? Absolutely, yes. Um, there, there are a great number of Shakespeare admirers among the Sturm und Drang authors, partly because, as, as we've already said, because he doesn't follow the rules. It comes all within himself. I mean, he is the quintessential original genius. I'm, I'm, we've dropped a stitch with Rousseau, Tim. I know you wanted to say rather more about Rousseau than you did, so if you can say where Rousseau fits into this, as we're talking about influences, Shakespeare is there. He's had a direct influence on the first play, the first play by Goethe. Yes. Uh, uh, and and so on. So just, if we bring in Rousseau, then I'll, I'll, I'll go on from there. Right, well, I think Rousseau must be introduced. He, of course, is he's a generation older than these men. One thing I should have said at the beginning, and we'll pick up it now, is that this is a, an angry young man movement. The, these the, these men, and they are all men, um, with all we, everyone we've mentioned so far has been male anyway, uh, they're in their 20s. Uh, Goethe was one of the older of the two, head a bit older still. Goethe was born in 1749. Uh, so in the 1770s, most of these um, Sturm, Sturm und Dränger are either in their late teens or early, or early 20s. And uh, what they liked about Rousseau 
was that Rousseau himself had had his own conversion experience back in 1749 on his way to Vincennes to see his friend Diderot when he, the scales, as he put it later in Confessions, had dropped from his eyes and he'd seen that all where civilization was heading with its rationalism and its enlightenment was taking mankind, humankind, down the wrong road to a different, a different kind of slavery. It was a, an enlightened, rational slavery, but it's slavery all the same. And that what really mattered, and then that Rousseau then works it out in his various discourses and his works, was what was happening inside the creative individual. So we're, we're moving with Rousseau very emphatically towards an expressive aesthetic. Not all the way, but we're, we're moving in that direction. And that was something which made a very powerful appeal to the Sturm und Drang people. And, and Rousseau actually is, is, is cited in a number of their works. Mike, uh, another influence, we've talked about Shakespeare, we've talked about Rousseau, another influence was a fake, Ossian. Yes. Um, the poem uh, supposed to come out of almost Homeric mists in the north of Scotland. That's right. Uh, and it was a fake, but it was very influential. Can you, and, but they took to it very strongly, didn't they? And there was a folkloric part of this movement too. Can you... Yes, I mean, it's it's really this, um, Herder is looking for models, although models in the Sturm und Drang context are not rigid rules. They are just people who did the right thing in their historical context. Shakespeare was one, Ossian, he thought, was another, and he thought he was a sort of Dark Age Celtic bard. It's particularly this looking back to older forms of literature where Herder felt this balance between reason and the emotions was still OK, was still beneficial for humankind, as it were. Because, I mean, it, it's very very much this idea that humanity is going down the wrong road and if we go down further we will end up in this kind of rational slavery as Tim called it and he wanted he felt there was almost a kind of you know religious zeal about this he, he felt it needed to be stopped and you needed to look for the complete human being which included the senses and the emotions and models can be found in older literature and Ossian was one of them it was just it, it did the movement some damage in a way it, when it was found out that uh, Ossian was a, an 18th century fake but of course he fitted the bill so perfectly because he was made up in the 18th century for exactly um, these concerns so to some extent it was ideal I mean of course Werther that um, the, the second part of the book is sort of under the EGs of, of Ossian whereas the first half the happier one is is under Homer so, I mean, these, these are key figures that they really looked up to and fitted into their new aesthetic. Susanna, can you give us uh, an idea of, of the chief characteristics of a, if there is such a thing as a typical Sturm und Drang play in terms of plot and style? Well, all of these, most of these authors have very different plots and styles, but I'll start with the extreme and the one that I think embodies the Sturm und Drang best, and that is Jakob Michael Reinhold Lenz who wrote a play called The Tutor, uh, wrote a number of plays, but the first one is The Tutor in 1774, about a tutor engaged in a household who instruct a 16-year-old maiden, uh, Gustchen, whom he seduces, who then gets pregnant, and who then runs off to commit suicide, and Leufa, the tutor, who is misinformed that she has succeeded in this design, self-castrates himself on stage. And at the end of this comedy, th that is what Lenz calls it, a comedy, uh, everything ends happily. All is forgiven. Gustin is re reunited with her, with her, um, with her fiancé. So I think what we have here is an author acknowledging that there are, that there are severe... Uh, once you focus on the individual, you obviously focus on individual problems. So here's an author saying there are severe problems... Um, li like seduction, like unwanted pregnancy, like infanticide, potentially infanticide, uh, like suicide, like self uh, doing damage to yourself. But at the same time parodying whatever solutions there might be found. And it is actually the case that the Stürmer, the Stürmer und, the Sturm und Drang hero very often at the end of the play dies because he cannot adapt to his surroundings. I mean, that's Werther, that's Goetz. That's Ferdinand and Kabbalah in, in Intrigue and Love. I mean, most of them actually don't make it through the play. I, I, yes, I agree with that entirely. And if I can just add about, uh, a word about the, about the tutor, or the private tutor, I suppose we should translate yeah. it as, um, there is definitely a social, radical, critical edge there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the fact that the tutor feels obliged to castrate himself uh, has often been seen, I think rightly, actually, as a metaphor for the the German intellectual 
who has all the intellectual capacity but no political power at all. Uh, and, and the fact that he turns himself into a eunuch uh, it can, can be seen as a, as a comment on their political impotence within the fragmented uh, political structure of the Holy, Ro Holy Roman Empire. There is a lot of social criticism in the tutor. Uh, the, 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 the major, the, the nobleman, is, is almost, almost a caricature, um, presented as mean, petty-minded, spiteful, well, um, a very disagreeable character indeed. We must, M Michael, we must mention Schiller, but briefly, I'm afraid... Uh, he said the later in his introductory remarks, Tim said he wanted to bring Schiller in, although he seems rather later than, than the mm. strict decade here. Um, can you say why you think the robbers is part, entitled to be part of Sturm und Drang? I think it's absolutely entitled to be part of Sturm und Drang. <laughs> it's the last flowering of Sturm und Drang, really. Um, it, it's it is a, the robbers is a Sturm und Drang play. It has the prerequisites of that particular emotional language of the of the very strong language, of swearing. There are different versions of it, toned down versions and 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 more explicit versions. There are like the Alvieta as well. Um, the the language, also the plot though. It's it's kind of a driven action, very fast, very. It's all about life and death and hell and he mainly hell rather than heaven. Um, and in the end, uh, the two protagonists who represent two different principles, two brothers, also Sturm und Drang motives, they're rivals, they both die. One is the arch-rationalist, he's very clever, very ruthless, he doesn't respect anything but his own profit. Um, he commits suicide, that kind of illegal thing. And the other one, the slightly better one, um, he good-looking, gifted, but a bit dissolute. When he's rejected by his father, he, he becomes this kind of rebel. He joins a band of robbers. A sort of, but, he, but he wants to do good. He wants to change society. Um, it's a bit of a Robin, Robin Hood character, really. Um, but he also comes a cropper in that he realises through his robber life he's become implicated in guilt and crime. And... Uh, he gives himself up to be executed. So while all this kind of violence and emotion and sort of drivenness is there, mm -hmm. at the end there's this question, what order do we follow and what do we do? And I think that's one of the kind of... It's one of the things that is... Mm -hmm. uh, they, they try to put something else in the place of what they are against, but they end up with quite a lot of questions. Susanna, do you want to come in? Yes, I... I would say the the fact that uh, Karl Moore gives himself up at the end, I mean, that is actually one of the reasons why many people say Schiller should not be part of the Sturm und Drang. I mean, I personally disagree with that, but but it is a different ending from what the Sturmer und Dränger usually do, this kind of self-understanding and this kind of almost acceptance of one's fate. That is actually what is not Sturm und Drang about this character at the end, I would say. Because Werther, Götz... Rail, rant and rail, and, and until the very end, don't they? Tim, you, Tim Planning, you've talked about uh, several times about the social aspect of this. Did it have a political influence at the time? Well, no, I don't think it does really. It's very difficult to extract from the Sturm und Dränger any kind of coherent political message. They're against. And I think, in a way, that's one of the things which they did have in common with the Enlightenment, that they are against. They're, they're against the inherited structures of the church and, to a certain extent, the structures of the state. But it would be very difficult to winkle out from just from the plots we've been summarising here any kind of coherent political programme. So, for example, in the play from which the movement took its name, Sturm und Drang, which was written by uh, Klinger, wasn't it, 1776? Yes. Although, I have to say, it, the uh, from that play, the title, uh, the, it, it was uh, then retrospectively imposed on the, on the period. They didn't think of themselves as being part of Sturm und Drang, as it were, although they did think of themselves as being a party or, or a movement or a group. I mean, they had a sense of corporate identity. In that play, Sturm und Drang, um, the, the play by Klinger of 1776, it's set in America, uh, and yet two of the main protagonists are going off to fight against the rebels um, for the English. Now, it's, you, you would have expected to be the other way round, but it, it, isn't, a, it isn't at all. Um, and Goethe, uh, throughout his life, I think, if he ever uh, offered an opinion on politics, it was very much of a conservative kind. I mean, he, he, and, and, he and, and Schiller, Schiller later, I think, although the Schiller of the Sturm und Drang has certain radical characteristics, they regarded politics as a rather subsidiary uh, activity. Why, my Gurgle, why did it last only... Ten years, almost, but uh, ten years. Why did it seem to disappear so quickly? 
Well, did it disappear? Well, I mean, you the, please, I, I'm sure. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think any it, all modifications and qualifications are welcome. It, it certainly ran out of steam, I think, as, as Tim said at the beginning. Um, and the, the kind of short answer to that is, to some extent, they grew up or they died. Um, it was such a kind of violent and radical movement, emotionally as well, that either they adjusted, as to some extent Herder did, although he did perhaps least so, Goethe certainly did, and Schiller in the end did as well, and they they are the great survivors. Um, many of the When you say adjusted, you mean changed completely in one way. I mean, Goethe no. went to Weimar, yes. and he became a different Goethe, didn't he? I mean, he resented the success of, uh, of the young Goethe, even when Napoleon... He didn't want to meet Napoleon when he came to shake his hand as the author of Werther, yes. yes. Um, I'm not sure Goethe ever really fully rejected his Sturm und Drang heritage, and neither did Schiller, I don't think. I mean, I I feel I can can hear Schiller's Sturm und Drang ideas reverberating through his great um, theoretical essays. And, I mean, Goethe spent his entire lifetime perfecting one particular play, and that's Faust. And Faust, of course, goes back to a fragment um, in his Sturm und Drang days, one of the first things he wrote before Werther, before um, Götz von Berlichingen. And Faust is a Sturm und Drang character. But, of course, Goethe, by that stage, is able to put him in context and say, "Mm, I'm not sure, is he a total hero? And there, watching Faust, you can see there are question marks. He's still presented as this striving person who follows his own heart at all costs, no matter how many dead line the, line the way. Um, but he, you don't walk away with this idea that Faust is a complete hero. He's questioned. I think he does this throughout much of his work. Susanna Court, we've talked so far entirely about male writers. First of all, were there any women involved? And secondly, were there a lot of women readers? Well, it does have that reputation, right? Uh, based on the heart with testicles, um, it does have that reputation as a purely masculine uh, movement, angry young men and everything we've said. There, I would say there are probably no women who can be counted as part of the Sturm und Drang, but there certainly were a number of what I would call observers, intelligent female observers, who wrote plays in the Sturm und Drang style while... Si- si- while attacking its premises, really. One of them that I would count amongst that, um, th- there are three or four only, but one of them that I would count in uh, in that group is Christi- a woman named Christiane Caroline Schlegel, who who led probably the least, the most unsturm und drang life that one can imagine. She was married to a pastor in some minor village, wrote a play about a menage a trois, um, in which the Sturm und Drang hero, Duval, the play is called Duval and Charmy, 1778, and the Duval, the Sturm und Drang hero, while keeping all of the opposition against the aristocracy, against society, against the court, all of the Werterian insistence on the right to his love is really portrayed as a domestic tyrant who terrorizes his wife, terrorizes his son, and ends up killing his lover because she will not agree to commit the the traditional Sturm und Drang suicide with him. So suicide really is turned into murder here, and love is turned into terror. Tim Blanding, it seems strange that it didn't really, Sturm und Drang, spread into the other arts in painting or music, or not much anyway. No, not very much, although um, because it has also been adopted as a chronological label that often happens to labels doesn't it um it, there's there have been attempts to bring in um in music for example there's, there's some of cpe bach's music some of haydn's symphonies from the 1760s and 1770s are described as storm and drunk indeed have been marketed as such but i i've really never been able to trace any kind of documentary evidence that there the haydn was influenced by any of the people we've been talking about it may be that um, the, the mood out there um, influenced him. It may, that may, that's possible, but that is so general. This really doesn't really doesn't work. I think the clearest case, the clearest individual case I can think of of Sturm und Drang finding its way into another medium would be uh, the Swiss German painter Fusli, or Fusli as he renamed himself, um, in his wild, wild paintings, uh, particularly of Shakespearean scenes, for example, there are there are definite p- p- uh, parallels, and there there is documentary evidence because he was very friendly with La Fata, who was um, a- a- in touch with all the Sh- uh, Sturm und Dränger. So there, there is definitely a-, a crossover. What role did Sturm und Drang play in the formation of eventual formation of a German national identity? 
Mike, could you go Yeah, first? perhaps, well, a, a huge one, I think, um, because it's around 1800, well, in the late 18th century that there is a sort of sense that the, a, a modern German identity needs to be created, if we go along mm. with this, that these identities are constructed. And it was exactly this kind of focus on older literature, on um, historical context, on your own historical context, that kind of made this thinking possible and it is also of course and we've mentioned this before German literature there isn't as much in the early half of the 18th century the enlightenment there is a German enlightenment but it's not as strong as the French or the British enlightenment and suddenly with the Sturm und Drang they burst onto the intellectual scene and this is becomes the platform for Goethe and Schiller to do their thing, Weimar classicism, and in the end it's also the platform from which German Romanticism is launched. And in the 19th century, when literary histories were written, Sturm und Drang becomes the starting point for German culture. It's, of course, also the basis for, or, or from it develops in, in this kind of huge cultural activity, German idealism, the new philosophy. And that, and that really makes it a political item. I think there's almost no way of talking about the Sturm und Drang that isn't political, because uh, the pre pre you know in the run up to the Nazi era and during the Nazi era right i mean here's heinz kindermann calling it the explosion of the german soul the original the first uh, quintessential german movement and it's played it's had a very difficult role to play or a very controversial role to play and conversely since the 1960s there have been all of these scholars who have given it a rather snooty treatment as this a uh, short-lived fad of angry young men who who had no political goals and therefore sublimated in literature, which is also not quite fair to the movement, I think. Yes, I think it's very important how politicised the reception of the Sturm yes. und Drang is. In the 19th century, that was the starting point of German culture mm -hmm. when it became implicated in this pithy line from Herder to Hitler. It became imperative that Sturm und Drang was minimised and the German Enlightenment was brought to the fore simply so one could mm -hmm. say, ah, the Germans are reasonable. After and so, all. sorry. And so, where where do you think it stands now, Tim? I think it stands on its own merits. The, it produced several works of, of of really very high quality, and so they, Goethe, Werther, the Robbers, uh, all those can survive uh, on in in their own right as things which we still want to read and are still moved by. Uh, Goethe himself referred to this as. Uh, a sense of Germany emerging, or Germanness emerging. That's how he, looking back on it, he saw it as Germanness emerging, emerging, and we can see it especially in the language. Well, thank you very much, Micah Ergel, Susanna Cord, and Tim Blanning. Uh, next week we'll be talking about logic and its history from Aristotle to the present day. Thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast, why not try others, such as Thinking Aloud, where Laurie Taylor discusses the latest social science research. To find out more, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.